Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. A new entry in the affordable truck market, Ford revealing its first compact Maverick pickup truck. Plus, his mother was killed right in front of him four years ago, and now a young teen keeps a promise he made to her. And why weren't they stopped? Several cars racing through a red light right in front of Detroit police. All coming up, we're going to begin, though, here at 6 with the weather as uh, rain has been making its way through Metro Detroit. Rumbling rain at that. That's right. We hear it yeah. outside here. Let's get over to Ben with a look at how long it will last, Ben. Yeah, Kim and Devin, it's coming down pretty good in spots. We have that flood advisory out for eastern Oakland County till 845. We don't have any severe storms out there, uh, but the stuff that's going on in the north zone still got quite a bit of uh, rainfall. Definitely some downpours here. As we take a 3D look at this, the tops of these thunderstorms are 40 to 45,000 feet. Those are pretty healthy. But again, when we look at just uh, some of the heavier returns there, you can see that a lot of that stuff, the heavier rain is reaching the ground up there uh, and it is starting to stack up. In fact, in that advisory area, we've got one to three inches of rain that has fallen and there are other spots that have picked up just as much. But as far as the rainfall rates go, you can see uh, for the most part, there are some up there that are in that torrential category, the purple shades. But here in our metro zone, it's light stuff. Uh, we'll talk about what that means for the game tonight at Comerica Park and how much more of this week is going to look like this coming up in a few minutes, guys. Hey, Ben. Our other top story at this hour, cars racing through an intersection, running red lights right in front of police. Yeah, the video shared over social media happened at the intersection of Livernoy and Tireman in Detroit. As Priya Mann shows us, street racing is a big problem in the area. Folks who live in this area say drag racing at Warren and Livernoy has only been getting worse over the past few years, and they're hoping DPD will crack down on the drivers racing through this intersection. Video posted to Facebook shows six cars blowing past a red light. The video is captioned Sunday Fun Day. Then a few moments later, a seventh vehicle flies through the intersection as a DPD cruiser pulls up to the light. I feel like they're scared of them. They're not doing much. It's not clear what happened after the officer pulled up because the video ends. But folks who live around Warren and Livernoy say what is clear is that drag racing is getting worse. We don't even come out here no more, and it's our neighborhood. These guys are going over 100 miles per hour. They're doing wheelies. It's dangerous. Hey, Wally! Hey, Wally! Last summer, at the same intersection, a chaotic scene. They really Wally! As drag racers took over the street, literally using flames to block traffic. Like last year, every single person, I was here like 2 o'clock in the morning, and they all had guns. It really started off fun, and then people get to drinking, and, you know, one thing leads to another, and that's how fights and all that stuff get started. Trying to tackle the growing problem, Detroit police launched an illegal drag racing and drifting detail in mid-March. But this gas station owner, who has several green light businesses, says he hasn't seen a noticeable crackdown on the drivers wreaking havoc in this neighborhood on the west side. Bring all the cops you can. There's a lot of people out here, a lot of kids that will come to this neighborhood. A lot of people don't even come anymore because of this. And that gas station owner says he's especially concerned about the weapons he's seen. Just last year, a man was shot and killed while watching a drag race. I'm told the police chief is holding a press conference Thursday to address the growing concerns. I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. All right, Priya. Well, he was 14 years old at the time when he saw his mother take her last breath. Latrice Morris Dorsey was shot and killed by her ex-boyfriend back in 2017. Since then, her son has overcome many obstacles. His latest, graduating high school and getting accepted to college. Larry Spruill sat down with the now 17-year-old about the promise he made to his mother and how he plans to keep it. I want to introduce you to Justin. His mother was killed four years ago right in front of him. She took her very last breaths in his arms. He was just 14. Well, when the incident first happened, it was like a shot to me. It hurt, mm -hmm. hurt a lot. Justin Dorsey says it's on the football field where he fights a lot of his battles, whether athletic or the biggest fight of his life, watching his mother die. Dorsey was just 14 years old when his mother was shot and killed by her ex-boyfriend. It was Father's Day. 2017. I hear the screaming and it just stops. And so in that exact moment, I run into the living room and I see my mom on the ground. He called his dad in 911, but it was too late. I get about 10 tiles. I put them on my mom and I get the hold in her. And she looked at me and she said, because my nickname is Jay. And right when she said to Jay, 
blood came out of her mouth and that's when I really knew she passed away. Wow. And it was her ex who? Yeah, her ex. You addressed him in, in court. Mm -hmm. What did you say? I really told him that it hurt. It hurt really bad. My mom was, a, was the nicest person, the most caring person. And for you to take her out of my life like that hurts my heart so much. Fast forward to now, Justin just graduated from Clarenceville High School last week. What was your GPA? Uh, I finished with a 3.1, but my last two car markers got, got two 4.0s. Thank you. <laughs> he got accepted to Ferris State University where he will play football and major in physical therapy. Where did that idea come from, uh, physical therapy? So my mom, she was a physical therapist assistant and uh, all her life she always wanted to help people. And I really noticed that she liked to help people and I think I get that from her, you feel me? Do you think she's proud of you? Yes, she is. Reporting in Livonia, Larry Spruill, Local 4. Larry, thank you. Well, today's coronavirus case count is the lowest single day total on record since last July. The state reports 293 new cases in the last 24 hours, the lowest since 262 cases were reported on July 1st of last year. Sadly, though, we've lost 56 Michiganders in the last day. On the vaccine front, 59.7% of people 16 and older in the state have received at least one vaccine dose. That includes 70% of Michigan residents age 15 and older. Around this time last year, there was a mad scramble to supply first responders much needed PPE. Now the state uh, apparently has so much of it that they are liquidating it. Defender Sean Lay did some digging today and joins us with what he found. Sean. Well, it's a good thing, right, that the state has so much PPE they can give it out to any entity that is fighting COVID-19. So they're liquidating it, but you at home, you paid for that PPE. It's federal tax dollars. And there are some unanswered questions about this situation tonight. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic here in Michigan, there were immediate calls, donations, fundraisers for PPE. We all now know that stands for personal protective equipment to protect our frontline workers against the virus. The gravity of uh, not having what you need. Um, so we said, we don't know what we're going to do, but we should do something. In late August, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services announced that it got a $25 million grant to help facilities with the increased costs of PPE, the tax dollars coming from the CARES Act, and the state was reimbursed by FEMA. Now, 10 months later, the state apparently has so much PPE, it is now liquidating it. In this email sent yesterday, obtained by the local four defenders, sent by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to fire departments and hospitals and other facilities, it reads, upon assessment of the state of Michigan post-pandemic personal protective equipment stockpiles, it has been determined the state has the capacity to reduce its current stockpile numbers. And apparently there's a lot left after what the state calls post-pandemic, including gloves, eye protection, respiratory protection, hospital beds, and mattresses that frontline facilities can ask for right away. Back here live, the thing the state told us, a uh, couple conditions here that any frontline facility can apply and get the free PPE, but it has to be used for COVID-19 fighting or activities. The thing that's gone unsaid and unanswered is if you need to go to the hospital and have to put on PPE or have a private ambulance ride, will you get charged for that PPE if it came from the state basically for free? We're live tonight. Sean Lake, Local 4, back to you. You got it right, Sean. From when to drop precautions to the best advice for those with young children, viewers continue to have a lot of questions about what's safe. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge is back to answer more of your questions submitted through clickondetroit.com. Hi, Doc. Hey, Kim. Yeah, so a viewer asks, I have heard scientists are developing a nasal spray vaccine and perhaps an oral vaccine. If so, how soon do you think those would be developed, approved, and or available in our area? I am married to a severe needle phobic, and the shot version is out of the question. So the answer is vaccines like that are being developed, but they are so preliminary that it isn't completely clear how safe or effective they might be or if they would ever come to market. The actual shot is going to be your only option for a very long time. Now here are more of your questions. A viewer asks, what about observations, treatments, and preventative dosages of ivermectin for COVID-19? 
Ivermectin is a medication most often used to treat parasites in animals. In humans, it is approved for topical application to treat head lice and a condition called rosacea, and orally to treat certain parasites that can infect humans. There has been interest in using it to treat COVID after researchers found high concentrations could inhibit SARS-CoV-2 replication in test tube experiments. So far, the limited human data does not suggest it's helpful, and both the FDA and the World Health Organization recommend against the use of ivermectin against COVID-19. However, there are ongoing studies looking at the drug. A viewer asks, help me understand what is safe for my unvaccinated children. Family members say, I'm vaccinated, so they'll be fine without a mask. The numbers are going way down. They won't get very sick if they catch it. These are the things I hear. I feel they should continue to mask up until they become eligible for vaccine. I don't think we should eat inside a restaurant yet. What is your best advice to keep our kids not eligible for vaccine yet safe? It is true that if you are vaccinated, the chances of bringing the infection home to your children is extremely low. It's also true that the numbers are going down, and generally, young children tolerate a COVID infection well compared to adults. However, only you can decide what is safest for your children. The current risk is not zero. Until they can be vaccinated, your kids will certainly be more protected by wearing masks and not eating in restaurants. Now, finally, Janice asks, my husband and I are fully vaccinated since February. Do we still have to wipe down the groceries and wait four days to read the newspaper or magazine? The answer, Janice, is no, you don't. The risk from COVID spread on surfaces is much lower than initially thought. If you are both vaccinated or frankly not, you can frankly feel comfortable dropping those precautions. Back to you. Again, a lot of good questions. We appreciate those answers. Dr. McNair. Uh, local 4 News update now. Livonia police arrest two men in connection with the deadly stabbing of a homeless man. This happened back on May 25th at Middle Belt in Plymouth. Police said the 23-year-old victim from Oklahoma and two men exchanged words when one of them pulled out a knife and stabbed the homeless man in the chest. Investigators say security video from nearby businesses led to the arrests of both men on Sunday, though the charges are still pending. We've got more to come here on Local 4 News at 6. Here's Rob. Do you recognize this headlamp? Probably not. The vehicle's not even on the road. There is a need for an affordable vehicle in our lineup. It's a pickup truck whose time has come. What does the rest of it look like? We'll show you.